you write you write in the essay that Trump, like Brexit, grew from the soil of loss and humiliation. So I guess as a as an overview style starting question, why is the idea of loss with its associated category of losers become such a potent force in our political world? Thanks, uh, Anthony. Um, <clears throat> I suppose we could start by giving a very telescoped um, picture of the historical shifts of the last, say, well, since since the 90s, because during the 90s, during the Clinton and Blair administrations, we saw what we might call um, the temporary and in a way illusory triumph of <clears throat> a kind of technocratic, meritocratic centrism, um, uh, a, a globalized economy that uh, Francis Fukuyama was celebrating as the, uh, the augur, the sign and seal of the end of history. Um, capitalist prosperity was going to spread across the globe. It was going to make everybody richer. It was going to, to in French, uh, liberal democracy as the unchallenged uh, supreme ideology of our society. And Fukuyama's twist was that this was going to lead to a kind of decadence because there was nothing, if you like, to keep liberal democracy sharp. Well, on that point, at least we can say uh, he was spectacularly and in a way fascinatingly wrong because all kinds of forces emerged from globalization to challenge its narrative of a triumph of, of um, centrist consensus. Um, one of them, of course, was the effects of economic globalization itself, uh, which led not only um, in parts of the developed world, but within the developed world itself, within um, the US um, and, and the UK and, and Europe, it led to massive pockets of deindustrialization and to the dispossession of a kind of authority, not just economic prosperity, but a kind of cultural authority of the working class. In other words, the working class having lost its basis of, um, and, and I suppose what in the US we would more familiarly call the middle class. These terms have slightly different resonances in the UK and the US, as, as I'm sure everybody listening here will be aware of. But um, uh, the sort of, the, the branch of prosperous workers, um, were dispossessed of everything that that gave them a certain kind of cultural prestige and privilege. And um, there was a kind of economic and political um, uh, dissolution, really, of everything that that kept the society together, cohesive, integral, um, and, you know, the deindustrialized states suffered not only um, economic flight, but also uh, opioid epidemics um, and uh, increases in, in crime. And the denizens of these patches of the prosperous developed world um, in the US, in, in, the, in say, you know, large parts of the Midlands and the North and the UK, um, came to be in a strict descriptive sense, the losers, losers of the globalized settlement. Now, the right, it turned out, were much more prescient and, um, uh, precise um, in addressing this predicament. 
they saw that what was unbearable for this constituency, which Trump, of course, went on to call his base, what was unbearable was the loss of cultural prestige and the humiliation of losing. Now, you can come up with all kinds of sort of sensible policy wonks, bromides for addressing these problems, but they have very little emotional resonance with people who are desperate and angry. Um, an angry constituency doesn't want to have gradualist solutions introduced to it and be told that somewhere down the line we'll start correcting the inequities of globalization. They want an immediate alchemical um, address. I'm not going to say solution because I don't think Trump offered solutions necessarily. I don't think in any case that was his appeal. His appeal was in a way rhetorical that he told a massive constituency that their loss, their humiliation, their sense of their <clears throat> sort of decentering from um, the center of American culture um, would be reversed in an instant by his presidency, by his power. Um, and this reversal didn't need to be specified in policy terms. It was enough for Trump to say that it would happen, um, that losers would be turned into winners, that in a, in a sense, just by sort of intoning the formula, by saying the magic words, Trump in that famous, and again, rhetorically quite brilliant reversal where he said, you're going to win so much, you'll be sick of winning. And of course, what the, the underlying subtext that was being reversed was you're losing so much, you're sick of losing. Um, so, in inverting the central verb, what Trump did was he turned losing into winning at a stroke. He created a rhetorical universe in which losing would be turned into winning. And so he, he lit upon this rather primordial terror we have of vulnerability, of loss, of humiliation. And he turned it all into its opposite. And he didn't do that by making policy promises, uh, by any kinds of prescription. He did it by the power of speech. And he's continued, one would have to say, to do that, to sort of cast a spell on his base, much more, I think, through rhetorical than through policy strategies. Thanks. That that sets up so many angles with which we can take. I mean, the one that, that comes to mind is, um, I suppose, a, a, an influential philosophical attempt to um, to rein in some of the, the kind of ways in which a meritocratic society creates this winner-loser structure that you were you were talking about, which is uh, Michael Sandel's book, The Tyranny of Merit. So um, I guess the, the tyranny of merit that he refers to is the structure that you were talking about, whereby in a meritocratic society, those who do well feel they're, they're sort of proud and they're the winners, and those that don't do so well feel terrible and that they're the losers. Um, one of Sandel's key um, goals in the book is to encourage us to cultivate um, a kind of an ethos of <clears throat> humility. So obviously, um, that's that's his sort of solution is to be a bit more humble to if, if you're doing well don't brag about it or um look down on the people beneath you and, and so on what, what's your sort of take on the idea of, of humility as a goal of public policy 
I mean, I, I want to preface my response just by saying that I think that um, Sandel does offer a very sort of precise and powerful critique of the basic premises of meritocracy. And in particular, um, because meritocracy was really um, a sacred formula, I think, for centrist politics from the 90s right up to the end of Barack Obama, who was uh, a, a, a real devotee, I think, of the meritocratic ethos. And I think Sandel, in a way, skewers meritocracy very effectively simply by saying that meritocracy, <clears throat> it actually implicates itself in the very inequality it thinks it's addressing. So it says, look, you'll only get by and you'll only advance yourself if you work hard and you show us your talent and your abilities. You know, nepotism and connections and luck are not going to get you anywhere. But this assumes that meritocracy comes into the world on a kind of blank state, uh, a, bl a blank slate, as though somehow we could start from a position of uh, social and economic equality, and then the cream will rise to the surface. But of course, we're not starting from that position. Um, the meritocracy is being formed out of a society which is profoundly unmeritocratic. That is, um, the rich kids will go to the best universities. Um, uh, they will already um, uh, have connections in the industries um, and the spheres that they want to succeed in. Um, you can't eliminate all the sources of prejudice and uh, bias and all kinds of social and cultural fury that are already baked in to our social contract. And so in that sense, the idea that um, you can implement a kind of clean meritocracy is a pretty, it's a, it's a pretty false premise. Add to that that meritocracy is ethically questionable because after all, even if you, are born with some outsized talent. His point is, that's your good luck. Um, uh, you know, a, a musical genius, of course, wants to be heard and we all want to hear him. But um, a, a musical genius is also the, the, the recipient of a, a kind of, whatever you want to call it, a, a piece of luck, a piece of cosmic grace. Um, uh, a genetic lottery. Um, so on, on, on that point, that basic critique, um, I think Sandel's contribution is really invaluable because from a mainstream, um, non-tendentious ideological perspective, he shows us that just at, a, at, at the level of philosophical consistency and ethical integrity, there's something wrong with meritocracy. Now, he then says, let's prescribe an ethic of humility in very much the way you describe it. Let's try and find ways in our public culture to teach people not to aggrandize themselves and to respect the contributions and the abilities and the styles of every kind of human being and not create hierarchies of value and importance. Now, how does one implement that kind of ethic, that kind of arrangement? It seems to me that Trump has shown us where the problem is, which is that 
you can appear to implement it by way of rhetorical gestures. If you call your constituency winners, at some level, if they buy into the, the, what you're doing, they become winners at a stroke. Um, if you say, um, I really am a very humble person, you know, I'm so humble in the words of Dickens, Uriah Heep. Um, well, you know, that could very easily stand in for humility. That could do the work of being humble, right? Um, the, the CEO can humble brag that after all, you know, he's no more important in the company than the kid in the mail room. Um, and we're all just one big happy corporate family. Um, the problem with these kinds of rhetorical gestures is that they're not really falsifiable. Um, and, you know, no one can prove them true or false. Um, they don't operate on that level. Um, they, in a way, are performative. They try to create a reality um, which is only as substantive as people want it to be. Um, and this kind of alch alchemy of rhetoric, I think, is something that's, that's uh, you know, I, I see in the book as, as kind of spreading um, across, across society, as though it would be enough to say something for it to be true. And that the person who has, in a way, the authority to say it and be heard um, creates reality. This is something I think Trump really capitalized on quite um, uh, perspicaciously. Now, um, if you want to be a little bit more careful sort of philosophically about humility, you might notice that humility is a very paradoxical virtue in the sense that, um, as all those old jokes about being so modest go, um, uh, as, as soon as you make a claim to humility, you've violated your own claim. Right? Humility is something that um, you, you can't make a claim on because it, it cancels out the humility that it's claiming. So um, I introduced, I suppose, a, a, someone from a more unexpected philosophical source, which is the, the French cultural theorist, and, and I, I would call him a philosopher, uh, Roland Barthes. And Roland Barthes um, has some very interesting passages in one of his seminars, one of his late seminars on humility, where he says that um, humility consists in a kind of self-counseling gesture. Um, it, it thrives not on its proclamation, but on silence, on withholding, on not making itself visible or audible. Um, and so humility would have to be, you know, if, if it were going to have any value, it would have to be much more careful. Um, and in a way, the, the requirements for a meaningful humility would have to be much more stringent than just a, a, a kind of throwaway rhetorical gesture. Um, that's where I introduce yet another philosopher, the, the Franco-Jewish philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas. Levinas um, is also, one could say, a philosopher of, of humility. He is somebody who talks about, uh, controversially, a kind of infinite ethical obligation of every human being. Now, this infinite ethical obligation, I am absolutely under the command of every other person and subordinate to them. In a way, it, it seems like a kind of metaph metaphysical extravagance, and, and it's, it's difficult to justify in one. But I think 
what is important for me about Levinas when he talks about infinite ethical obligation is that it doesn't come out of a position of virtue. It doesn't come out of a wish to say the right thing, like the corporate CEO who wants to be very humble. It's not something, you know, Levinasian humility is not something you can proclaim on Instagram. Um, Levinasian humility is has to go via kind of passage through a kind of arrogance. Um, in other words, you your your humility, if you can achieve it, has to travel through a kind of, I mean, he doesn't use the word, but through a kind of narcissism, through a kind of investment in your own interests, in your own desires, in your own enjoyment, as he puts it, your enjoyment of your own being. Um, and this command of the other, it's not just some cheerful imperative, some imperative that you cheerfully submit to because you're such a very nice person. And so you're going to go around being charitable and being generous and being a good host and loving refugees and loving old people and loving the disabled and loving everybody who's disadvantaged. Um, uh, that again, too quickly becomes a kind of gestural um, ethics, which, which is about demonstrating how good I am. Um, a more difficult ethics that I think Levinas is, is, is propounding is to say that all of that comes not from a wish to be good, but on the contrary, a wish to murder the other. Because the other, the Levinas, is the person who obligates me, who wrenches me out of my enjoyment, pleasure in being me enjoying my good meal and my good movie and my, you know, Netflix and comfortable home and everything else that I um, want to have for myself, right? The other dispossesses me of my pleasure in this kind of self-prioritizing. And this doesn't make me particularly well disposed to the other, if I'm being honest. In fact, it makes me quite murderous towards the other, because the other is the person who interrupts the continuity of my pleasures. Um, and that murderousness is something we have to go through. It is, it is in a way integral to my humility. There's no humility without going through the passage of that feeling of murderousness, resentment, um, and sort of weariness with the, the, the demands that others place upon us. Thanks, Josh. That was a, a brilliant answer. I mean, um, certainly the, um, the, I mean, what you referred to it as was a kind of a vigilant, humility which mm. I, I suppose I, I take to mean that you can't just have the humility without say the hubris or the arrogance or even as as you put it potentially the the murderousness at one point you write um you cannot be humble before the world if you haven't felt the wish to destroy it and I suppose maybe that's what distinguishes a um a philosophical style argument from a psychoanalytic one perhaps the philosophical one tends to be a bit more naive or idealistic like humility sounds like a really good idea let's be humble right. whereas the yeah. psychoanalyst and perhaps the cultural theorist may come in with a little bit more suspicion about the ways in which the, these things are motivated I mean one of the one of the phenomena you pick up on in the book is what you call um, splitting and so in in the context of the book you're talking about the ways in which um, Trump kind of inaugurates a world in which anything that um, instantiates loss or vulnerability is is kind of split off. And, and the power of this world is it gives him and perhaps by extension his supporters um, a sense of their 
invulnerability to loss or doubt or uncertainty or ambiguity. Um, there's another sort of th another thing which you don't specifically mention in the book, but I guess splitting can also be the ways in which you, I mean, you, you focus on invulnerability versus vulnerability, but it could also, it could also be good versus bad. Yeah. So I suppose, what are we to do about this if splitting is kind of the, the norm? Like if, I mean, at one point you say, um, you acknowledge that the psych the psyche is a space of ongoing conflict in which coexist radically incompatible impulses. That seems to be something that as humans we we struggle with. So splitting becomes the norm. So what are we to do about that? Um, um other than you know mandate uh, a mass program of, of psychoanalysis which I, <laughs> exactly that's yeah, it's, that's it's the not, obvious it's answer not, it's not the most practicable um of, of policy solutions um <clears throat> i think we probably need to find ways of promoting and cultivating uh richer public conversations because the the, the problem at the moment i think is that our public conversations and debates are structured by splitting. Um, and our entrenched positions then are sort of just inserted into the same repetitious cycle of argument and counter argument, in which all that's really happening is that. Um, uh, positions that are already known are being repeated and affirmed by people who already hold them. The problem with splitting is that it allows no point of entry into the other's perspective because the other has already been split off as evil, right? Democrats in this universe, for example, in the, in the Trumpian universe, aren't just wrong or misguided, um, but they're satanically evil. Right. You, you can't have curiosity um, or a kind of honest assessment of somebody that you've already decided in advance um, is um, serving, you know, has been enlisted by satanic forces. Um, and, you know, lest I sort of repeat something of this tribalism, split tribalism myself, I will say that this is, you know, um, inevitably a symptom of left politics as well, that um, it, it, it can be just as profoundly incurious about what the other has to say and where it's coming from. Um, and where this malaise of splitting, the appeal of a splitting politics um, arises from. Um, and I, I think that one thing that we've lost from public culture, um, or you know, have, have, have we lost it? I mean, one can easily be nostalgic and assume that it really once existed. Um, but certainly, you know, I can remember a time when it was possible, I think, for people taking profoundly opposed political positions to have an intelligent and curious public exchange. That no longer seems possible. We seem now to be able to only entrench existing splits. And I'm not arguing here for a, a kind of centrist politics of compromise and let's all just, you know, um, split the difference, if you like, between us. Um, uh, but for a, a, a kind of a form of, of political contestation, um, dissent and disagreement that is informed by curiosity and openness to what the other has to say, rather than um, uh, a kind of 
tenacious clinging to the positions that you know and the and and the 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 the, the positions we already know. Thank you. So we'll we'll go to questions in a in a minute. I mean, there's so much um, more that um, it would have been great to to talk to you about. I mean, one of the one of the figures that um, emerges as a slightly um, beleaguered or even impotent character in your book is the the so-called fact checker and um, the one who tries to um, show how the the facts claimed by Trump or other populist style leaders are in fact not not true. I mean, I suppose what I found interesting in your account was that maybe what the, the fact checker really struggles to, to realize is that we're living in incommensurable realms of, of truth. And it, it's not just that there is an attempt to deny the facts, but rather that the whole world of facts is in Trump's world part of being a loser, like the fact checker is the loser in, in, in Trump's world. So, I mean, you, you've talked, you, you also talk about the ways in which um, language in, in a political debate sometimes moves beyond truths and truth and lies to be become what you refer to as a sheer force, an instrument not of deceit, but of humiliation. So when you kind of get these almost completely um, separate worlds of reality, of truth, of the very meaning of what language is used for. Um, obviously, we're in a bit of a tricky situation. And obviously, I'm not expecting you to um, have any neat solutions. But do you, do you have any thoughts beyond the kind of virtues you mentioned earlier of openness and curiosity on, on how to refine a way to, to speak? Right. To the public? right. Yeah. I mean, the 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 error, if you like, um, the, of the of the fact checker is not to recognise these incommensurable realms of truth and indeed incommensurable realms of speech. The thing that the point that Trump is making, in a way, to the to the pointy headed fact checker, is that the fact checker is a loser because he or she is subordinate to a truth that they don't possess. They don't make their own truth. They um, defer to a truth outside of themselves. Now, this is precisely what um, the Maggie universe has gone beyond. This is precisely what it means to say, you're not losers, you're winners. Um, you, you simply, um, <clears throat> Uh, um, create the reality that you want. You 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 sort of hunger it into being by stating it, rather than by building it, by by you know making it piece by piece. You you bring it into the world wholesale by saying it is so, um, and the the facts in the face of this um, can seem like an irrelevance unless, and this is where Hannah Arendt's points about fact-checking are so important, that the person who appeals to the facts in a world in which all truth has been irrevocably and irreversibly politicized, in which, if you like, everyone lies, everyone's truth is, is merely um, enlisted in the service of, of advancing their own political interests. If you get to that point, then the fact checker has to acknowledge the weightedness, if you like, the political freightedness of, of the gesture of fact checking, not assume that he's speaking from some God's eye view of indisputable facts. Um, and this, again, sort of, it overlaps, I think, with the point about um, a, a vigilant humility, that, that you can't sort of conjure um, and counter a, a, a universe of lies with the pristine truth that you um, have a, a kind of, you know, that you have reference to and that you can invoke 
the slay the dragons of of the lions. Um, you have to sort of acknowledge that you are operating in um, a field of of irreducible distortion, right? A, a, a distortion that is not something that you can remove to create an undistorted reality, but a distortion that is part of the texture of reality. And that that's what you're speaking into. And that in some ways, your facts are another bit of noise, another bit of distortion in, in the political atmosphere. This is not tidy and it's not, it's not, it's not pleasant, but I think that part of humility probably means abandoning the illusion that any of us speak for, you know, a, a kind of realm of pure facts that, that, you know, I mean, we, 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 can, we can take that position, sure. Um, but I think all we're doing is trying to make ourselves feel better. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Josh. Let's turn to um, some questions. Um, so the um, <laughs> so let, let's start with one from David, which looks more to the consulting room than a than a than the political realm. He asks, "How how would you engage with a client who suffers extreme low esteem through judging her or himself as a loser?" Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's a, thanks, David. It's a, it's a, it's a great question, um, and of course, it, it, it's if psychoanalysis and psychotherapy have a bread and butter, that's probably it. Um, and I think the difference between a psychoanalytic approach and any other psychotherapeutic approach to someone's conviction that they're a loser is that it's very easy in a way you see that the, the cognitive approach not to indulge in some sort of you know splitting anti-cbt fest here because I, I try not to do that but my disagreement with the with a cognitive approach um or my sense of its limitation is that the cognitive approach is the approach of the fact checker. I mean, quite literally, um, uh, you know, cognitive therapists talk about thinking errors, talk about distortions. If you say to somebody, I'm a loser, it's very easy to turn around and say, but look at what you've achieved. Look at all, all these great things about you. You're clearly not a loser. Um, to somebody who feels, who, who comes sort of, gripped by the malaise of feeling like a loser, there is, that, that is very, very rarely comforting. Because apart from anything, if they want to do that, they can do that themselves. They know what they've achieved, you know, they, they, they know that whatever it is, that they dress well, they have lovely children, that they, you know, are professionally successful, that they do great things for their friends and family. They don't need fact checking. <clears throat> um, what, um, what they're looking for, I think, is for somebody to take seriously their, I mean, to, to invoke um, a, a, a phrase of the odious Peter Thiel, um, that they need somebody to take them seriously, but not literally. Um, and I think that that is the psychoanalytic approach. It's, it's to say, what about this is true? Not true at an external level. We're not interested in saying, oh, okay, so you're a bit of a loser in the sense that you didn't get that promotion. Well, let's see how you can, you know, you can get it in the next round of promotions. We're interested in what it is at the heart of them that makes this self-judgment true and to try and get hold of uh, uh, whatever in their experience entrenches this idea in them um, and 
makes them sort of feel um, that they um, they are destined to be losers. That is a long, and I mean that that is the substance of a piece of of psychotherapeutic work, and it can last, you know, anything between some months to many many years, um, because if you know, and, and and some people ask, well, why does it need to take so long? If the the, the self perception of being a loser is part has has become part of the structure of your of your character and your self understanding. Um, undoing that. Allowing, uh, cultivating a different version of oneself is is a sort of life's work. Really, you know, it's it's something that the person is always going to struggle with. It's not something you can remake by saying the right thing. Right? I mean, again, you can take a Trumpian perspective, you can take a positive thinking perspective, and tell the person that they're a winner. And in certain circumstances, that might have a kind of endorphin boosting effect. But I think it's it it it's it's not long lasting. And somewhere the person knows that you know the person in a way might have tried those kinds of uh, uh, affirmative strategies themselves. I mean, people very rarely come to psychoanalysis as anything but a last resort, so they're prepared for the long haul. They're prepared for the work that allows them to really remake their image of themselves over a long period of time. Thank you, Josh. So the questions are, are pouring in. Thank you all very much. So this is a question from Jana, who picks up on something we were talking about, about how do you address people who privilege feelings over facts um, when, when quote thought seems to be in the realm of religious belief or righteous anger, what territory is there besides friends and enemies and the next step into dehumanization and elimination of, of the other? Um, it's funny because when I was thinking about your book in my head, I sort of summed it up as a book about binaries and violence. <laughs> that sort of seems to be what um, yes. Jan is getting at here is that when we split into like feelings versus facts, there is this. Yeah kind of seemingly irresistible move towards dehumanization and yes. elimination. So yes, yes. Um and and Yana will probably have already gathered that I, I don't think that the solution lies in somehow restoring um a, a, a kind of supremacy of facts. Um partly of course because facts are bald and always belong to a context of interpretation and freighting and can be used to do anything you want. Um, you can um, bolster all kinds of racist mythology by, you know, stating facts um, about, you know, the financial status of Jews or the, you know, certain kinds of crime statistics. Um, uh, Facts are, are very easy, of course, to manipulate and to surreptitiously smuggle feelings into. And the thing about feelings, I mean, I, I, I feel tempted here um, to invoke somebody who doesn't appear in the book, but the neuro the neurologist and philosopher, the neuro neuroscientist and philosopher, um, Anthony Damasio, um, a really fascinating writer who makes an important distinction in a number of his books between emotions and feelings. Now, emotions are, if you like, closer to the stimulus response elements of behavior. Emotions are what we show on our face when we're happy or sad or angry. Um, our behavior and our comportment 
expresses that emotionally. So if you like, it's the external component. And what's fascinating is that he shows that, you know, in various psychology experiments, you can see that contrary to, in, counterintuitively, emotions come not before feeling, not, not, not before, um, not after feelings, but before. In other words, we don't feel something and then emote it and then give expression to it. We actually give expression to something first, right? If somebody um, makes us angry, we have a stimulus response that sort of acts out the emotion before it's been internally processed. And the second stage, which might of course last nanoseconds, but it's nonetheless significant in terms of our understanding of, of selfhood and how the mind works. Feeling is, is that moment where the stimulus response is sent back into the interior of the mind. And feelings then are our internal processing of our response. They are in a way deeper and richer than emotions because they, they circulate in them. They um, confront us and they need some kind of processing. Um, and they involve a kind of thinking process. Um, I don't mean they involve a kind of rationalization where you say, oh, what I'm really feeling, or I really feel this way because, and you sort of rationalize how you're feeling. It's more that, that, that you're able to inhabit and psychically engage in feeling, right? That it's, it's more than stimulus response. It, it's actually, um, <clears throat> about making contact with yourself. Feelings are really about making contact with yourself. And so in a feeling culture, as opposed to an emotive culture, um, we are actually in dialogue with ourselves. We are actually trying to communicate with what it is that we're experiencing and to make sense of it, to represent it to ourselves, to have some sense of why we're angry why we're angry without reducing it to a rationalization which gets rid of the feeling and so i don't think that we need to get rid of feelings in order I mean, i'm not i don't think that's what yana was suggesting but i don't think we need to get rid of feelings from politics i don't think we can of course get rid of feelings from politics i think that we need to be in a more intelligent, internally dialogic relationship to our feelings and less in that mode of stimulus response, which a culture of political splitting promotes. Thank you, Josh. And there's other questions come in, like for example, from Anne about the role of social media, which I think very much picks up on the thing you're talking about, about the instant emotional thing. Um, obviously we're pretty much at time, but there's a question that Dee's posted both to the Q&A, but also to the to the chat. And it relates to um, the abandonment of striving on the part of so many young people, not just in the West, but in Asia, um, and how this attitude relates to a rising sense of aversion or even repulsion to the outcomes of the winner stroke accomplishment philosophy. It kind of feels like that's what your whole um, writing over yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, too. so I'm sure you've got a, a few things to say about that Josh yeah I do and of course I mean you, you might remember that in not working I write about the Japanese phenomenon of uh, and and Korean as well um and and in a way American and in Mar America they're, they're known as shut-ins um in here they're called meets or not in educational training um so the hikikomori in Japan is, is a really um, epidemic social phenomenon that was um, uh, sort of 
uncovered by a Japanese psychiatrist in the early 90s, um, in which he, he what he sort of uncovered was a, a, a massive proportion of Japanese youth who had withdrawn completely from uh, social participation, withdrawn into their bedrooms with the collusion of their families uh, who didn't want to expose the shame of this withdrawal and so um, would bring meals to their room and allow them to live this completely sealed off existence in their bedrooms. And he estimated, the psychiatrist estimated that um, <clears throat> uh, there were approximately one million young people um, uh, in Japan um, who were to some greater or lesser extent uh, in the grip of this malaise, hikikomori literally means um, social withdrawal. Um, it is, I think, a, a kind of disillusionment with the imperatives and the uh, uh, of, of productivity and purpose and achievement um, as the ultimate value of a society. Um, it is a kind of blind protest, if you like, against the inhumanity of that demand for achievement, um, the way that it, it sort of overrides um, what I might want or what I might be feeling about myself. Um, uh, it, 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 it's, I think, a protest against the, the sort of the making interchangeable of the human being, the fungibility of the human being. The idea that um, you insert yourself into a blueprint of success, of affirmation, of positivity that has nothing to do with you.